Next on Unsolved Mysteries. At the time his wife disappeared, Paul Polis says he was out running errands. But her family believes Paul knows much more than he's saying. A military policeman is found shot in the head. The Army says he killed himself, but his family says he was murdered. A man known for his nasty temper and love of guns escapes from prison with the help of his young girlfriend. And thousands of lines form the mysterious shapes in Nazca, Peru. Some believe they were landing strips of alien spacecrafts. How were they made and why? Five stories of crime, deceit, and intrigue. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us. This is the actual phone message that Paul Polis left for his in-laws on the day that his wife, Charlotte, vanished from their home in Ohio. Uh, I just wondered if maybe she was with you guys or if she called you or something, man. To many, Paul Polis sounds like a concerned husband. Getting a little freaked out here. But Charlotte's family believes his is the voice of a diabolical killer. I think Paul got angry and he struck her and he couldn't stop himself. And I think Paul killed my daughter. They can point the finger at me all they want. I didn't do anything wrong. I know I didn't do anything wrong. And I can't change what other people think. Has Paul Polis gotten away with murder? The police can't say because there's not enough evidence to prove that a crime was even committed. So Paul and Charlotte's families will remain locked in an ugly dispute over what happened to Charlotte the day she vanished. About the only thing everyone agreed on was that Charlotte was sick the day before she disappeared. Hey, we're back. Hi. Oh. Hi. Paul's parents watched the couple's two children while Paul took Charlotte to the hospital. Doctors told her that she had a serious ear infection. Hi, Mom. Yeah, we just got back from the hospital. After Paul's parents left, Charlotte called her mother to check in with her. Pills and a prescription and... It was the last time that Charlotte was known to be alive. She said, I'll talk to you in the morning. And at 1.25 a.m., I had hung up the phone from her. At 10 to 9 on Saturday morning, I called the house to check on my daughter. And Paul answered the phone. Oh, she's done a little bit better. Uh, she's still up in bed. She's still sleeping. Will it, will, is she OK? The well, doctor said the best thing now is just to get some rest. Will you have Charlotte call me when she gets, gets up, would you? All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Paul says the last time he saw Charlotte was shortly after that phone call. A little bit better. Just a little bit? I know you're tired. I want to go out and take the kids uh, with me for a little bit. I think it was about 11 o'clock. I took the kids out to do errands for the afternoon, and I told her, just stay in bed and relax. Um, I'll bring the medication that you need back. Just stay in bed, take it easy. Paul says it was a busy morning. He buckled the kids into their car seats and made stops at the pharmacy, the laundromat, and a scrapyard. When you get something to eat. How's then he bought burgers for the kids at a fast food restaurant. I know you guys are hungry. But several people dispute Paul's version of what he says he did that day. One of those people is Charlotte's mother. She claims 
that she called the house several times before 11 o'clock when Paul says he was still at home. I called at 10, I called at 10 after 10, I called at 20 after 10, I just kept calling, calling. I thought, something's not right. And no answering machine, nobody answering the phone, nothing. And I thought, well, where is she? A neighbor also contradicts Paul's claim that he simply put the children in the car and left. It was 10 after 11 when I pulled out of the driveway. And as I backed out, I looked over at Paul's house, and he had his car backed up to the, the porch. The trunk was open. All four doors were open. His car was completely packed with boxes and bags. There was no sign of the children, and there was no way they could be in the car. And as I drove by, he looked at me with a really strange, eerie look. He uh, indicated that he had the children with him all this time. We've talked to people that he made contact with. No one saw the children with him. My children were with me all afternoon. I don't abandon my children, not for a second. I don't leave the house and leave them unattended. I don't leave them in a car unattended. I'm not that type of a parent, never will be. Char, we're home. According to Paul, Charlotte wasn't home when he got there. It was around 4 p.m. Char, are you in here? I figured that she was feeling better and had gone out. Let's see if she looks Put the kids up to finish their nap in bed and uh, just watch TV and finish cleaning the house. About 7.30, I noticed her purse up on the cabinets, and my wife doesn't go anywhere without her purse. I can't believe that she would have left without it, so I started calling around to see if she'd gone out with anybody. Hey, guys, what's up? Uh, this is Paul. I'm just calling to see if you guys had seen Char at all. Um, Charlotte's family was alarmed and headed over to the house. And, uh, she's not here. Charlotte's sister, Amria, arrived first and began looking around. She noticed two sets of footprints in the snow. They went from a side door towards a small shed and then back around the house. The doors were bulging into pretty much out of the shed. They just had like a regular padlock on it. And it kind of bothered me the way the shed was because the doors weren't flush against it. So I'd gone into the house and I had asked Paul for the keys. He got very angry. The shed has nothing to do with Charlotte, and I'm not giving you the keys. And she'd asked him repeatedly for these keys to the shed, and he got angrier and angrier. It's a shed. All the normal garden tools, lawnmower. It's, as a matter of fact, I think at the time there was a key lock, and there was a key on Charlotte's ring. If they wanted it open, I would have given them a key. I don't remember anything about that. By the time the rest of Charlotte's family arrived, they discovered that Paul's parents had already gotten there. They were cleaning everything from the attic to the basement. They were washing walls. He had washed, uh, he had did laundry. He had washed, like scrubbed up the kitchen real good and stuff, which isn't, you know, it's not characteristic of Paul to do that. What was his mother cleaning and his father? What was all this cleaning that went on while they were there? The only floor I scrubbed was the kitchen floor so I wouldn't stick to it where the baby had dropped his food. I'll clean. I live there. I like to live in a clean house. The State Bureau of Criminal Investigation came in to check the house, find out if any crime of violence had been committed. The house was spotless. It was clean from top to bottom. And it's very unusual that a house is cleaned this way. Investigators did find a blood stain in the trunk of Paul and Charlotte's car. The sample was too small to be positively identified, but it was big enough to cause speculation that Charlotte's body had been in the trunk. Paul weighs 150 pounds. Charlotte weighed approximately 300 pounds. Paul would be required to transport a body that was twice his weight and take it out into the open and, and put the body in the trunk of the car. To me, it just does not seem possible at all. But to Charlotte's family, the two sets of footprints in the snow suggested that Paul had help. 
And I looked at Paul's shoe prints and they were the same footprints that were in the snow and the other footprints were fairly large with a shoe boot who I can suspect would have been his father's, but they, you know, I can't be definite on that. Either his parents were brought in after the fact to help him or they were there at the time it happened. We have lived in this area for 40 years. We're not that type of people. I can't imagine why they would think that. Paul even agreed to take a polygraph test, but on the day of his appointment, he disappeared. Paul! He left a note on his dresser. Part of it read, I love my wife and would never do anything to harm her intentionally. Paul was gone for three months. Then one day, he reappeared with an explanation. I had a lot of mental anguish I was going through, and I wanted some time alone. People were driving in front of the house nonstop. They didn't come by to give me a hug or pat on the back and say, we're with you. They just came by to look. Talk to you later. Bye. Charlotte's disappearance seemed to have affected everybody. Charlotte's family began to wonder if the children had seen anything. I feel that my granddaughter witnessed the violence and that it's locked into her memory. We had to get rid of all dark trash bags in our home and go with light colored trash bags. She's paranoid of a dark trash bag. She screams and she cries because mommy was put in a, in a dark trash bag. I think the child is being coached and the sad part about it is it's very detrimental to the child. They're destroying this child. I didn't kill my wife and I don't know where she is. I didn't have anything to do with it, nor did my family have anything to do with it, as far as I know. Update. According to the police, Paul Polis remains the only suspect in this case. If you have any information about the disappearance of Charlotte Polis, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a military policeman dies under suspicious circumstances. Was it suicide or murder? Huntsville, Alabama. Military policeman Chad Lankford is finishing what should have been a routine patrol of his army base. Chad radios his base station. He tells them that he's stopping to investigate an abandoned car. Papa 2-1, say again. Then the transmission stops. 2-1, this is Redstone, say again. Get a unit. All available units proceed to South Patton Road, locate Papa 2-1. All gates locked down. Secure the post. Within minutes, the backup officer arrives to find a bizarre scene. Chad's military ID tag, armband, and his portable police radio have been deliberately arranged in the middle of the street. There was no sign of Chad. Then, a quarter of a mile away, the officer finds Chad's body. Oh, this is Papa Sierra. I've located Papa 2-1 at Bunker 8745. Officer is down. I request ambulance and backup immediately. The officer was shocked by Chad's condition. His head was bleeding and he was barely breathing. His cap had been stuffed in his mouth and the cord from his radar unit was wrapped around his neck. His pistol strap was tied around his ankles. His handcuffs were clamped on his left wrist. On his left hand was a cryptic message written in black ink. March 3, and what looked like the name Robert. But he's still alive. Have to get his shirt off. Oddly, 
Chad's 45 caliber pistol was found under his left shoulder. Get that out of here. Ballistic tests would later show that two shots had been fired from Chad's gun. But it couldn't be determined whether either of them had hit Chad. Get an ambulance here ASAP. Go. Chad was rushed to a local hospital where he died two hours later. He was just four months away from his 21st birthday. Chad's family was shocked to hear that the Army's explanation was that Chad had killed himself. They're convinced that he was killed in the line of duty. When I heard that, I was very upset about the whole thing. I, I know that my boy did not commit to kill himself. There's no way. I feel that someone is covering something up here. Chad Lankford was raised by his father and grandmother in a small Northern California community. He joined the Army right after high school and was sent to South Korea. He earned several good conduct medals. Chad joined the military police at Redstone Arsenal as soon as he returned from South Korea. Chad's family says that he loved the Army and planned to re-enlist. However, a few months later, Chad's personality suddenly changed. In January, he called me and told me that he'd been asked to uh, do some you know, undercover work. He called me three or four different times, and each time he'd give me a little bit about his still working undercover. Hi, Dad, how you doing? Yeah, okay, I guess. Listen, remember what I told you a few weeks ago about my new assignment? Well, it's getting pretty intense. I had asked him just exactly what he was working on, and he said, with guns and drugs. Probably two or three times he told me that uh, uh, if he was found out that uh, he was a dead man. I've been getting threats, you know, phone calls and letters. No, I don't know who's sending them. I, I don't recognize his voice. I mean, it, it, it might be nothing, but I'm starting to get worried. And I don't know what to do. At that time, I told him, Chad, you got to get out of this. And he came back with, I can't get out of it. 14 days later, Chad was found with a fatal bullet wound to the head. The Army's Criminal Investigation Division, or CID, reviewed Chad's death for four months. They concluded that he had not been involved in any undercover narcotics work. They said that Chad killed himself after suffering from long-term emotional problems. I'm sorry, that I just can't believe that, any of that. I mean, I mean, I raised the boy for 20 years. I know him better than that. And uh, the military has psychologists out to talk to you for, or call you over the phone and talk to you for 10 minutes, and then they have the complete life story of everybody. And uh, they're so far off base, it's unbelievable. The report claimed that Chad's suicide was triggered by a breakup with his girlfriend. The CID report said that Chad committed suicide for the distraught over my breaking up with him. But that wasn't true. Um, I didn't break up with Chad. Chad broke up with me. I'm involved in things you don't even understand. I can't even talk about them. But why? I mean, I mean, why do we have to break up? Is there another person? Is that it? That's it, isn't it? Why no, there's no one why? else. Why do we have to break up? Can't you understand English? Just get out! I had a feeling that someone was telling him to break it off with me. And I think Chad did it to protect me or something. In their report, the Army claimed that Chad had been plotting to steal from the Army PX and cited interviews with three soldiers to prove it. It seems very strange to me that somebody would come forward to the Criminal Investigation Division after someone was killed and said, yeah, we're planning on robbing, we were planning on robbing a PX fan. It's really tough that he's not here now to be able to uh, tell us what really happened. Just hours before his death, Chad left phone messages for several friends, but not his family. The CID interpreted Chad's calls as goodbye messages prior to his suicide. There was a message on the machine from Chad it was him calling to say hi and how was I doing? Was I taking care of myself? 
and that he would see me soon. Sorry I missed you. Um, give me a call. Bye. It didn't seem like a goodbye to me. Chad uh, would have called me if something was to the point where he was going to commit suicide. I know he would have. Um, he didn't call me, and he didn't call his grandmother. Uh, so there weren't, go weren't goodbye calls, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, uh, I know he would have called me. Next, the Army's Criminal Investigation Division makes another shocking claim about Chad Lankford. Huntsville, Alabama, the Redstone Army Base. While on routine patrol, military policeman Chad Langford was found shot to death on a deserted road. There was a single gunshot wound to his head. The military insisted it was suicide. The official inquiry concluded that every aspect of Chad's death was methodically staged by Chad himself. Redstone, this is Papa 2-1. I have a stranded vehicle. They said he called in a false report of an abandoned car. Roger, you that he had staged the scene to look as if he had been accosted and then murdered. The official report even claimed that Chad's accounts of undercover assignments were a total invention. Chad's family, however, does not believe he committed suicide, and neither does Huntsville reporter Julie Schultz. To start with, it was very bizarre even from the night that it happened because um, the Huntsville Police Department and the other law enforcement agencies never heard a word from the Army about any of it. And generally, when there's a police officer that's shot, I mean, there'll be a manhunt everywhere. They also said there wasn't a struggle, but there was a struggle. I mean, I mean there's no doubt about it. They found two buttons in the front seat of the car. Even before the Army ruled that it was suicide, there was just wild speculation as to what could have happened to him. People were saying espionage, drug deals, all kinds of things. Then it perpetuated itself as it went with the CID reports. Jim also believes that the military police missed opportunities to question possible suspects that night. The MPs stopped two different cars within a mile of where Chad was found. But in both cases, they didn't even question them about Chad's death. It's absolutely crazy. You're talking about a murder here. And it appears to me that anybody within a uh, three or four mile radius of that place should have been stopped and held for some, for some time. They didn't do that. A source close to the investigation says that one of those drivers was named Robert. The same name that was found scrawled on Chad's hand. Those who believe Chad was working undercover are convinced his sudden and violent death was nothing less than murder. I feel that he went down there on that part of base because he was supposed to meet somebody down there. It would have taken more than one person to handle Chad. He was very strong, very agile. And then again, he knew these people. I know he knew these people. Redstone, this is Papa 2-1. I need backup now. This is Papa 2 I think Chad was involved when he was telling he was involved in. He was an in-between person with some drug dealing. I think he was put in that position by somebody on that base, whether military or civilian, he put somebody put him there. And I think he was a middleman, and I think he was set up. Who did kill Chad Lankford? Did he take his own life after staging a murder scene to hide the real truth? 
or were his accounts of undercover intrigue all too true and he was the victim of a secret drug operation. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a violent convict convinces his young girlfriend to help him break out of prison. Seventeen-year-old Melody Woods was not the kind of girl you would expect to get into trouble. She liked school, she didn't stay out late, and she had just started dating. But all of that was before she met Michael Short and fell in love. Fort Worth, Texas. Melody, Michael's here. Sorry. I, I guess you met everybody already. Yeah, we're just getting to know each other a little bit. Melody met Michael during summer school. 19-year-old Michael made a very good first impression. But Melody's parents never guessed that the man their daughter was dating had a criminal record. Six months earlier, a couple was driving on a highway in Texas when Michael and a friend pulled up behind them. They're starting to bug me. Michael Short harassed the frightened couple for 10 minutes becoming more and more agitated. Hey, Grandma, where'd you learn how to drive? You look at him run right over you. Don't look at him. Play on freaking games? I'm playing freaking games and my little brother there. And he's got a gun drive, do something. What's up, Ray? Run! Police tracked Michael down by his license plate number. He was charged with attempted murder. A few months later, while he was out on bail, he met Melody Woods. She fell head over heels for Michael. I mean, from the very first day, she came home and was so excited about him, telling me about him, and just thought that he was everything that she had ever wanted. Melody's parents say their daughter found out about Michael's past, but it was too late. She was already under his spell. I want you to have this. It's a beeper. Duh, I know what a beeper looks like. When I call you, I'll punch in 911. Drop whatever you're doing and give me a call right away. I don't want to have to worry about you. Deal. I had to talk with her and I told her, I said, I, I, I'm afraid that, you know, he's being a little bit too possessive. And she was like, well, you know, we just really enjoy being together and there's really nothing to it and he's not possessive. A few months later, Michael Short was found guilty in the highway shooting. He was sentenced to eight years in prison. Melody's parents hoped that the relationship would end, but Melody refused to give up on Short. After the impact wore off, she started talking about, I can get through this, you know, I'll make it. It may just be four years, it may not spend eight there, so we'll, we'll do the best we can, I can make it through this. The jail phone became the young couple's lifeline. Oh, where are you? He called us day and night, night and day. He was relentless with the phone calls. I mean, they just never would stop. The phone calls at first were a blessing for Melody. I mean, any contact that she could have with him, she was thrilled to death. As time went along, she started to get a little irritated. But then Michael would say, you, you just don't understand how horrible it is for me here. You're the only thing I've got. They're from Michael. You can't forsake me now. You're my soulmate. And it just really would make her feel bad. So then she would go back to accepting all the phone calls. From jail, Short controlled every aspect of Melody's life for more than a year. Even his fellow inmates called him the little bully. One summer morning, authorities learned just how much control he really had over Melody. That morning, Melody and a girlfriend waited outside the prison in a borrowed van. All right, Rex over, line it up two to time in front of the gate. Short saw his chance and ran for freedom. Hey, Short, hold it. Stop, or I'll shift. He's coming! Go! 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 
The entire escape took less than one minute. Short changed his clothes at a nearby hotel and dumped the van. Then he and Melody left in her car. I personally don't believe that Melly had any intentions on leaving with him. There's a lot of things she didn't take with her. It was uh, clothes and girl things like rollers and hair dryers and just a bunch of stuff. The only thing that we've received from Melody since her disappearance was one postcard from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And the only thing that that postcard said was, I'm OK, I'm sorry, and I love you very much. That was about a week after her disappearance. What concerns me the most about Melody's disappearance is that just that uh, she's disappeared, and we've had three unconfirmed sightings of Michael. Nobody has ever seen Melody, and one would have to wonder, has she already become a liability to him? Update. After nine months on the run, Michael Short and Melody Woods were arrested in Fort Worth, Texas. One of Melody's relatives told authorities where to find them. Michael Short received an additional seven years that ran concurrently with the aggravated assault charge. He has since been released. Melody Woods received 10 years probation for her role in the escape. Next, a grown woman meets the father she never knew. By the power vested in me, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. 17-year-old Patsy Summers married her high school sweetheart in El Paso, Texas. At the time, only Patsy and her husband knew that she was pregnant. Seven months later, Patsy's daughter, Jeannie, was born. From a very early age, I felt very different and separated from my family. Patsy died when Jeannie was 21 years old. When Jeannie read her mother's diary, she learned that the man she had known as her father wasn't really her father after all. The diary described how Patsy went to a local park after getting into an argument with her fiance. Hello. There she met Duncan who was stationed at Fort Bliss, Texas. Patsy was immediately smitten. They soon began dating, and Patsy decided not to tell her fiance or Duncan about each other. My mother, she thought of Duncan as a very kind person and even stated that of all the people that she had known, that he was the kindest uh, person um, she had ever met. Six months later, Patsy was pregnant. She knew that Duncan was the father, but she decided not to tell anyone and to marry her fiance. There's something I want to talk to you about. Patsy, what is it? Patsy ended the affair, and Duncan never knew that he was the father of her child. My firm belief is that secrets only cause people harm and cause a lot of suffering. And um, that's why, for me, the truth has to come out. And I have to know who Duncan is. Update. The night we aired this story, a woman named Suzanne Gilmore was watching. At the time, Suzanne's husband, Duncan, was sound asleep. Jeannie's mother had written in her diary that he was the sweetest, kindest person that she had ever met. I just said, that's my Duncan. I knew that it was my Duncan. And the next thing I know, my wife woke me up. And she said, were you ever stationed in El Paso, Texas, at Fort Bliss when you were in the Army? And I said, yeah. And she said, were you there in 1958? And I said, yeah, I was there in 1958. And she said, did you ever know Patsy Summers? And I said, yeah, I know. I knew Patsy Summers. 
And I said, it's very important. Did you sleep with her? And he said, well, yeah. 9 days later, Duncan and his daughter Jeannie met for the first time. Hi. Hi, honey. When I hugged my dad, it was a combination of being really, really happy, but also uh, there was a little sadness there that so many years have gone by and that we've missed out on each other's lives. I love you. I love you, too. I will always remember Jenny coming to the door and for the first time seeing my daughter and, and holding her. Never could I have hoped in a million years or prayed a thousand prayers for this to turn out as well as it has. And he's turned out to be everything that I thought he was going to be. And tomorrow and the day after, I'll now have a dad who loves me and wants to be a part of my life. The Nazca Plateau. 100 square miles of magnificent drawings etched into the desert floor. No one knows when, how, or why they were made. Some say they were created to appease the gods. Others believe they welcomed visitors from another galaxy. This spider is located in the eastern corner of the plateau. It's formed by a single line that starts and ends in the same place. But for what purpose? This giant monkey is the size of two football fields. 800 lines shoot across the plateau. Laid end to end, they total 1,000 miles. Evidence suggests that the ancient Nazcas inscribed the giant drawings between 1,500 and 2,500 years ago. But the Nazcas left little behind that tell us the meaning of the figures or reveal how they were made. All told, there are nearly a thousand lines, shapes, and figures spread across the plateau. One of the first archaeologists to visit Nazca believed that the plateau was a giant astral calendar. He observed that on the longest day of the year, the sun lined up perfectly with one of the markings. A German mathematician named Maria Reiki studied the plateau for over 40 years. She concluded that many of the lines and animal figures pointed to major constellations. If you go out there at dawn, where you can see the sky, you can see the dawn glow reflecting off of those lines, and they really become like lighted pointers to the heavens. A radically different theory was proposed by author Eric von Daniken in the late 1960s. He claimed that some of the markings were giant landing strips for alien spacecraft. He suggests that the Nazcas had constructed the runways under the direct orders of aliens. Von Daniken identified this 850-foot marking as a signpost pointing to the landing strip. And he thought that this is a portrait of one of the explorers in a spacesuit. Scientists aren't against the idea of necessarily extraterrestrials per se, but we do expect some evidence before we then start doing a lot of research in that direction. In 1982, archaeologists tried to figure out how the Nazcas made the lines. They decided to replicate the whole process using only simple tools. We pirated a couple of broomsticks from the local hotel, some pieces of string, laid out a line, and we proceeded to clean and sweep away the surface of the line. It took us, a group of 12, one morning to make a line about 20 yards long, two yards wide, clear it completely, and here was a brand spanking new Nazca line. 
Dr. Avani's line looked similar to some of the other figures, but creating this line and the giant sprawling monkey were two different things. It took a tremendous leap of imagination to make these large models on the ground, which they themselves presumably did not see, not being able to fly. But Jim Woodman, a British author and explorer, argued that maybe they did fly. To prove his point, Woodman hired a Peruvian craftsman to stitch together a hot air balloon from materials that would have been available to the ancient Nazcas. Perhaps for the first time in centuries, the figures were seen from a hot air balloon hundreds of feet above the desert. However, many scientists still believe that the lines were meant to be experienced from the ground. The straight lines look like roadways. They start from someplace, they lead to someplace. The idea that the lines are meant to be walked on seems to me to be a much more feasible one than the notion that somebody had to look at them from above. The animals are made out of a single, sinuous, continuous line that begins and ends at the same point. I can imagine that a worshiper of a deity would walk around one of these animal figures to pray to the god or gods that had to do with that animal, that probably some invocation to the gods would have happened here. But in the end, there are no conclusive answers to the mystery of the Nazca lines. Those who created the wondrous artwork have been dead for centuries buried in tombs that surround the plateau. Over the years, their bones have been carelessly scattered by grave robbers. However, the ancient mysteries of the Nazca will most likely remain undisturbed forever. <laughs>